Okay, I'm doing a video about my first big ocean-going sailboat that I bought. And uh, I bought it in Santa Cruz, California in 1993. And uh, it was 41 feet overall and uh, 35 feet on the deck. And um, so I was looking to buy a boat. Um, I've been sailing since I was 14. Uh, my first time I sailed was um, on a uh, Hobie Cat 14. I went out by myself on it and flipped it over and uh, I was hooked. <laughs> and um, so, um, at any rate, I uh, ended up a few years after that buying my first boat. And it was uh, just, a, it was like an El Toro. So it was uh, eight feet long and made out of wood and uh it was a cat boat so it only had one sail one mast one sail and um i don't know if uh if you know what an el toro is but they're these little boats that have a kind of a squared off front end the bow's not pointy it's it's square and uh they're kind of cool little boats um they do have regattas here in the san francisco bay uh, i think they still have regattas with uh, with them and, um, but, uh, at any rate, um, so that was my first boat that I bought. Mm, I would say just out of high school, probably I was attending junior college at the time. And, uh, so first time I took it out was at night and at uh, Woodward Reservoir, it's in the Central Valley. I grew up in the Modesto area and, uh, got out on the lake a little ways and the rudder fell off. So that was uh, kind of an interesting experience. And uh, so eventually I, um, I put a bowsprit on it and so I could put a jib sail on it. So I, I put a jib on it and uh, I can't remember where I got the jib or if I made it. I probably made it. And uh, I think I did. I probably used blue polytarp and... Uh, so I, um, I had, uh, I had that boat for a while and, uh, and, and just prior to buying that boat, um, I worked in a print shop and, uh, a friend of mine's dad owned it. And he also bought a Catalina 30, 30 foot sailboat. Uh, I think it was, uh, like in 1977. And, uh, so we used to go sailing out on the San Francisco Bay and that's when I really started getting hooked on wanting a bigger boat. And uh, so later on, um, I, uh, my El Toro boat finally, because I kept it outside and in the rain, it rotted and started falling apart. So I decided to build my own boat. So I built, a, it was about seven feet overall. And it was like, it was like my El Toro that had a flat bottom. And I, uh, but I wanted a pointy bow, so I didn't want that squared off bow. So I made a, made it a pointy bow and I made it out of plywood. Um, and, uh, so it turned out really cool. I, I made my own mast. Uh, at that time I was working, uh, at, on a research farm and, um, we had a uh, sprinkler pipe that's made out of aluminum. So we had all this sprinkler pipe that we'd lay out in the field, hook it together when we needed sprinklers. And, uh, each section was 30 feet long. So um, my boss gave me an old piece of uh, a sprinkler pipe that um, we didn't need anymore. And so I made a mast out of it. I think I cut it down to about 11 feet. And uh, at the time, a new technology was emerging and that was in-mast furling or the mainsail rolls up inside the mast. Matter of fact, the only boat I knew that had that at the time so this was in the early 80s, was uh, a sailor named Dodge Morgan. He was an American sailor, first American to sail around the world nonstop alone. And uh, he broke 13 records when he did this. And uh, I think the previous record before him was 282 days. And he did it in 150 days. And so basically he just sailed to the bottom of the earth and sailed around the world and then came back up. He started in Maine. Portland, Maine, but he had problems with his autopilot, so he had to stop um, in um, Bermuda. 
and he got the autopilot fixed and then he restarted his around the world journey. He wasn't racing any other boats. Uh, he was just trying to go for breaking the, the, the speed record around the world. So he left Bermuda, sailed around the world, went to the bottom of the earth, basically sailed around the world, around Cape Horn, all the capes, and uh, then sailed back up to Bermuda. And he did it in 150 days. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so he was the first uh, American to do that. So I was really hooked. So this little boat that I was building at the time, just after Dodge Morgan's trip, um, I was really interested in the uh, in-mast furling. So I went ahead and built my own in-mast furling on this little seven-foot boat. And I made my own sails, and uh, I wished I would have made them out of better material. I used actually used blue poly tarp, and I cut the panels out just like a real sail. And uh, I used my mom's sewing machine and uh, could do zigzag stitching. And so I went ahead and stitched all these panels together, and I made the sails. I made the mainsail and the jib, and they both were furling, roller furling. And uh, it was a great little boat. Uh, I did a lot of sailing. Uh, mainly in the Central Valley in the foothills of the Sierras. Uh, the main, <clears throat> I'd sail in, there was like three different reservoirs I'd like to sail, but mainly I like Turlock Reservoir. And um, so they, there was islands there. You could, I could sail to all these little islands and have lunch. And and it was a, it was just a great time. So at um, any rate, I uh, still really wanted a big ocean going boat it's my dream to you know maybe sail around the world someday so i uh i bought this boat in santa cruz and uh like i said it was 41 feet overall 35 feet on the deck and i told myself i was not going to buy a wooden boat i knew better i knew better just don't don't buy a wooden boat um the problem with wooden boats is um you could have it surveyed and there will be no dry rot, no problems. And that doesn't mean that three months later you lift up a floorboard or look somewhere in the boat and find dry rot. So you're constantly living with dry rot, the possibility. And uh, so when I bought this boat in Santa Cruz, the guy wanted $20,000 for it originally. And I, uh, I actually was able to talk him down to 9000 and because I got a, that good a deal was because he had bought it. Uh, the boat was built by a cabinet maker and um, it was all wood made out of plywood, supposedly marine grade plywood. And uh, he, um, so the, the first owner was the builder and then he sold it to this English guy. The English guy wanted to sail it back to England. Well, he had the whole boat fiberglassed over on the outside with like one layer of fiberglass cloth, which is not structurally doesn't really do anything. Um, and even though you put fiberglass over a wood boat, it's still a wood boat. It's not a fiberglass boat. So I looked at this boat and I fell in love with it. And um, so I didn't get a survey. I, you know, you should always get a survey. It's just a really good idea. But I thought, okay, I'm just going to go through the whole boat. And I knew about dry rot. And so I thought, okay, I got an awl, which is like an ice pick. And I, and I just went through the entire boat. I crawled through every, under the floorboards, everywhere. I mean, every inch of this boat was in the water. So I didn't have it hauled out. But I figured uh, if, it, if there's dry rot anywhere, I can find it. Because mainly wooden boats, they rot from the inside. And the reason they rot is because not of salt water. Salt water actually protects the wood. It preserves the wood. It's fresh water that rots wood. And the reason for that is fresh water has the rot organisms in it that will cause the dry rot. And so basically what happens is rainwater gets in the boat and that's what causes dry rot. And it usually starts inside the boat. So... I, and I knew that. And so I went through the boat and I poked at every square inch of that boat looking for a draw right. I couldn't find any. The previous owner said he'd never seen any. And the other problem with the boat was the second owner, the English guy, when he bought it, he, he had it fiberglassed. And he took it out for sale and he sailed it down to Capitola, which from Santa Cruz is just around the corner. It's not very far, just a couple of miles. 
And uh, he had engine problems. So he pulled up and tied onto a boring ball there in Capitola and took a hose off the engine because a hose, I guess, was leaking, got a hole in it or whatever. I don't know exactly what it was, but he said he removed a hose off of the engine and had somebody give him a ride to go get another hose. And when he came back, he didn't turn the through-hole fitting off the seacock uh, that the engine's connected to for the cooling. And the boat was almost completely sunk. So he, uh, he pumped the water out and had the boat towed back to Santa Cruz Harbor. And everybody told him, make sure you clean all the salt water out of that engine before you try to start it. Well, he didn't do that. He just tried to start it. It had salt water in it, ruined the engine. And uh, the strange thing about this boat was the engine originally had a diesel engine in it. The engine was off to one side of the boat. It wasn't in the center, which is really strange. The, the, the engine was actually in the galley inside a cabinet, and it was on the port side of the boat in the middle. And, of course, engines are heavy. So what they did was... On the starboard side, under the floorboard, they had a big chunk of cement that they poured in there to counter the weight of the engine so the boat would be back level. And, uh, and the prop and a shaft went out on the port side, so it wasn't in the center. And so the prop was over to one side. And uh, so... When he tried to start this engine, he ruined it because he didn't clean the salt water out. So then he took the engine out piece by piece, threw it in the dumpster, and bought a used Lehman 60 horsepower diesel engine. This was pre Ford, it wasn't a Ford Lehman, it was just a Lehman. And he wanted to put this engine in the center. And he was went to hire this guy to drill through the keel uh, so he could put in the prop shaft in the center of the boat. Well, the guy that had the experience in doing this was on vacation in Alaska, so he couldn't find anybody. So he did it himself, and he actually did a good job. He did a really good job put, putting in this prop shaft. And um, so he had this fiberglass stern tube that he put in, and then the prop shaft had a cutlass bearing in the back just like you should in a stuffing box on the other end inside the boat and it was an inch and eighth uh, solid bronze prop shaft and a two-bladed bronze prop and um, so he did a good job on that but he couldn't figure out how to attach the engine to the boat so i come along you know um you know, a sucker comes along, which was me, and uh, and buys the boat. And I felt pretty confident that I could make this work. And so this engine was sitting on wooden blocks, and it weighed over 500 pounds. And so I used to come along to lift the engine up because I had to get underneath it to make measurements so I could build an engine bed for it to sit on and bolt to the boat. And the the boat made out of plywood, it had a uh, framework in it. And the framework was made out of, it was like four by fours that were laminated. That one, like the boat goes this way, here's the bow and the stern's back here. And then there's all these frames going across inside. And uh, so under the floorboard, there, was, there, there were like four by fours going across that were all glued together, laminated. And um, so I figured I could go ahead and, um, and clamp it to those frames, the engine. And that should be strong enough. And so I, uh, I worked on, on the research farm, like I said earlier, in the Central Valley. And I knew how to weld. And we had all this stainless steel because it was uh, the research farm was what we did was we grew all these vegetables um, for dehydration. So it was for food processing. So there, we used a lot of stainless steel because you want everything to be clean when you're dealing with food. And uh, so... We had a big bone pile of stainless steel scrap, and my boss said, just take whatever you need. So I went ahead and found all these pieces of stainless steel, these square tubes of stainless, and I 
cut it with a carbide cutter into pieces that I needed and shaped it and uh, welded it all together with a certanium welding rod so I could weld the stainless. And uh, I made this engine bed. And um, uh, when I bought the boat in Santa Cruz, uh, the, the day I bought it, the seller introduced me to my neighbor. He, he lived on a 34-foot Cal sailboat. And uh, so he introduced me to him. And then after the seller left, and I'm there, the, the guy in the cow, my neighbor, opens up his companionway hatch and stuck his head out. And he said to me, so why did you buy that boat? And I go, well, I liked it. I, that's why I bought it. He goes, you shouldn't have bought that boat. He goes, you know, the engine's not hooked up. And I go, I know all of that. And uh, he goes, you shouldn't have bought it. And so, you know, the first day I buy a boat, I'm real happy, excited. I bought my boat, and now this guy's just like bringing me down, you know, just like making me feel pretty bad, like I made a big mistake. So um, every time I saw him, he was just totally negative. And it was getting to the point where I just felt like telling him, look, if you don't have anything good to say about this boat, just, just shut up and leave me alone. I don't need this crap. So at any rate, I went ahead and... I lifted up that 500 pound engine with the come along, didn't use a chain to secure it, which I should have, and very dumb. I climbed underneath it, all I was hang holding it up was this come along with the stainless steel cable, five, over 500 pounds, and I crawled underneath it and I made all these measurements, luckily it didn't fall on me. And uh, it would have been easy just to put a chain on it, you know, to make sure it didn't fall, but you know, I was in a hurry. And just stupid stuff. You should never do stuff like that. And I went back to the farm with my measurements and I welded up this engine bed. And it was big. It was like a big frame, you know, like wide and heavy. And I come walking down to my boat in Santa Cruz carrying this thing. And my neighbor Lee opens up his hatch and sticks his head out and goes, what's that? And I go, it's, it's the engine bed for my engine. He goes, where'd you get it? I go, I built it. He goes, you built that? I go, yeah, I built it. And all of a sudden, he had a, a, a whole change of attitude about me and the boat. And um, so he ended up being a really cool guy. Um, I had a wheel bearing go out on my car. I had a Honda Accord, four-door Accord. And the back wheel bearing went out when I was in Santa Cruz. When I got over there, it was going out. And I was stuck. I mean, I, I was by myself, and I didn't know anybody. And so I took the wheel off the back of the car in the parking lot and he saw me and he goes, what, what, what are you doing? I go, the wheel bearing shot. And he goes, do you need a ride? I'll give you a ride to Cragen's and to the auto parts store. And I said, yeah, please. And so he gave me a ride and I got the parts and I fixed it and I was able to get back home. So, um, but at any rate, I went ahead and, and uh, was, you know, getting ready to install the engine. Two weeks after I bought the boat, the previous owner came back and he wanted to get his dock box. In Santa Cruz, you actually own your own dock box. And so the previous owner came down and he goes, can you help me carry the dock box up and put it in my truck? And I said, sure. So we were carrying it up. And just before he left, he, he tells me, he goes, you know, when I was putting the new engine in the boat, I accidentally dropped it on the prop shaft. He had the prop shaft already in the boat, attached and in. He goes, I dropped the engine on the prop shaft, but I, it didn't hurt it. And it's like, great, a 500 pound engine dropped on the prop shaft and he said it didn't hurt it. Uh, I'm starting to think, yeah, I'm sure there's probably gonna be a problem. So at any rate, I put my engine bed in that I built and I made, it, it, the engine had rubber mounts, engine mounts. So I went ahead and put in, I made my own engine mounts because I wanted rigid. I didn't want the boat engine to, to flex or move. I wanted it totally, totally solid attachment to the boat. That's the best you can have for an engine because you want that prop shaft to be aligned. It has to be aligned to the engine within one thousandth of an inch. And so it's real critical. And um, so flexible mounts, you know, meh, not, not crazy about that. So I went ahead and made my own engine mounts too. And uh, so I put in the engine bed and bolted it to the boat. It fit perfect. I couldn't believe it because usually stuff I build is not perfect and I have to go back and redo it and redo it and redo it until it's right. It was perfect, fit in just perfect. Then I lowered the engine down 
and put the engine on and attach the engine to the engine bed. And that was perfect. Couldn't believe it. So then it had a V drive. So the engine actually sat backwards in the boat. That gives, it makes the engine farther back in the boat. So you have more room in your interior. That way you don't have your engine inside the interior of your boat in your living space. And so it was, the engine was kind of under the cockpit in the back. It was an aft cockpit boat. And so, um, so the, uh, the moment of truth now, the engine's in, it's bolted to the engine bed. The engine bed's bolt to the boat. Everything was perfect. And because the engine sat backwards, it had a V drive. So the transmission, the transmission was a V drive transmission. So, um, at any rate, so the prop shaft goes up through, through the, into the transmission and actually through the transmission through the output shaft, which has a hole in it. So the prop shaft can go through it. And then there's a coupler that, goes on the prop shaft. So the prop shaft has a slot cut into it. So it's a keyway. And then you got this round coupler that it's made out of stainless steel that goes onto the prop shaft and that bolts onto the transmission. So it has six bolts. And you use that coupler to align your engine. You have to move your engine around to align the engine with the prop shaft. And again, it has to be within one thousandth of an inch before it's properly aligned. So the tolerance there is, is crucial. If it's not aligned properly, you can damage your, your cutlass pairing. You can damage your stuffing box. You can, you can get a vibration problem, which can damage your transmission and actually damage your engine. And so I, um, the moment of truth was putting that coupler on and I put the coupler on and I just guesstimated the engine position and bolted it all down. And that coupler went right on perfect. I got a feeler gauge to check to, for the, to see if I, I can get it within one thousandth of an inch. It was already there. It was one thousandth of an inch. I couldn't believe it. I'm thinking, I don't believe this. I, I've, you know, I've, I've done a lot of projects in my life and none of them are perfect, but this, the whole thing was just perfect. I couldn't believe it. So then I started thinking about the previous owner saying he dropped the engine on the prop shaft. So I thought, okay, here's the moment of truth. I went ahead before I bolted the coupler to the transmission. It was attached to the prop shaft, but it was not bolted to the transmission yet. I took the prop shaft by hand and turned it 180 degrees and it went out of alignment by an eighth of an inch. And when you're shooting for one thousandth of an inch, an eighth is a mile. And so my prop shaft was bent. And I didn't have a lot of money and I didn't want to have the boat hauled out of the water because I was going to have to have this prop shaft pulled out and maybe replaced, which is going to be really expensive. So I come up with the idea, maybe I can pull the prop shaft out while the boat's in the water. So I talked to one of my neighbors who was a diver and he said, uh, yeah, we can, we can, we can do that. We can pull the prop shaft out. Um, he said, uh, I'll go down and get a wooden dowel and you can put it in the stuffing box because when I pull the prop shaft out, he's going to go in the water and pull it out from in the water. Um, he said, water's going to come gushing in the boat. So you're going to have to stop it. So, he went and down and got a wooden dowel the same diameter as my prop shaft. So I, when he pulled, he was in the water. And when he pulled the prop shaft out, water started gushing into my boat, kind of like a fire hose. So that was kind of nerve wracking. And I put the, the wooden dowel in the stuffing box and tightened the stuffing box down. Well, I put that wooden dowel in pretty far. I didn't need to, but I did. And um, so I took the prop shaft, put it in the back of my truck. I made a special out of like three two by fours, a special holder for it so it wouldn't bend. You know, you got to keep it as straight as possible. And I took it to a, a place called the Prop Shop, Prop, a place called the Prop Shop in Antioch, California. So I had to drive from Santa Cruz to Antioch, which is um, in, over in this um, Delta area. The guy at the Prop Shop looked at it and says, "I don't know if I can straighten this." He goes, "I'll try." He goes, look, somebody took a grinder to it and it was all ground up. He goes, it looks like somebody tried to straighten this out. 
using a grinder. He goes, I don't know if I can fix this. So he put it on a lathe and he turned it on the lathe. And he called me up and said, I got it within one thousandth of an inch. And it's great. <laughs> you know, that's good. I, that, that should work. So I came back with the, I brought the uh, prop shaft back to Santa Cruz. It didn't have the prop. I removed the prop by then. So it was just the shaft. Brought it back to Santa Cruz. And I went to pull out the wooden dowel out of the stuffing box. And I couldn't get it to come out because it was wet in the seawater. And the wooden dowel swelled up. And so, and it was hard to get to the stuffing box. I, it was, I had to lay on my stomach on the floor and reach way in under the bilge to get to it. And it was really, really hard to get to. And I couldn't get it out of there no matter what I did. I couldn't even twist it. So I had to figure out how am I going to get this thing out of there. And uh, so I came up with an idea and I went back to the farm and I made a special puller. So it was a uh, two long all thread bolts and I drilled a hole through the wooden dowel and the other part connected to the stuffing box because I didn't the stuffing box is connected to a rubber hose which is connected to the a stern tube which the prop shaft goes through which is made out of fiberglass fiberglass tube so a fiberglass tube hooked to a rubber hose hooked to a brass um, stuffing box and I didn't, if I, if I pulled that rubber hose off by trying to yank that um, plywood or that um, wooden dowel out, um, water would really come gushing in my boat. My boat would probably sink because it'd be almost impossible for me. It, it was so hard to get to. It'd been very difficult for me to put that rubber hose back on with all that water gushing in and try to tighten it down. <clears throat> so I had made a, I made a puller that would pull the wooden dowel out without pulling on the stuffing box. And so basically I had to turn these, I had two all thread, long all threaded bolts. Um, they're rods with threads, basically just two thread, uh, threaded rods. And then I had these nuts on there and I'd take a wrench and I'd turn one side and I'd turn the other side and I'd turn this side and then that side back and forth. And slowly, little by little, I was pulling this wooden dowel out. I put it in like a foot and a half. All I need to put it in was a couple of inches. And uh, so you know, I can only get over to Santa Cruz on the weekends. And so it literally took me a whole month of weekends going over there before I got that wooden dowel out of the stuffing box. And then when I finally got the wooden dowel out of the stuffing box, water comes gushing in the boat. So I decided this time instead of having to hire the diver to put the prop shaft in from the water, which I thought was going to be probably nearly impossible. I decided I'm going to put the prop shaft in from inside the boat. And that's what I did. So I pulled the wooden dowel out, water starts gushing in, I picked up the prop shaft and I put it in the stuffing box and I just pushed it down. And luckily I was able to wiggle it and get it to go into the cutlass bearing and got it into place. And then I cranked down the stuffing box, which has this rope inside, it's like a rope that's got wax on it. And that's what keeps the water from leaking in around the prop shaft. So the prop shaft can spin and it leaks a little bit a couple, you want it to leak, I, I can't remember, it's like three drops a minute or something like that. It's it's a real slow leak and you want that leak um, because that lubricates the, it, it lets water come in and it lubricates the cutlass bearing and also the stuffing box packing. Flax packing is what that's called, that rope that's in there. And uh, so I, I got it. And then I hired the diver to go ahead and put the prop back on, put the prop on, zinc back on the prop shaft and uh and then i put the coupler on and sure enough it was aligned within a thousandth of an inch so all was good and uh so i um when i was doing all this and when i bought the boat i thought i had a slip in santa cruz harbor permanently um when i bought the boat we went up to the harbor office and the harbor master wasn't there but the harbor master assistant was standing there and i asked the previous owner, the seller of the boat. I go, now is this boat, is this slip transferable? And he said, yes, it's transferable. And the harbor master assistant was standing there. He didn't say a word. So I thought, okay, great. I got a slip in Santa Cruz. I didn't know anything that there was a waiting list to get a slip in there. Eight years in the part of the marina I was in. On the other side of the bridge, on the outer harbor, it was a 24-year waiting list. So at any rate, 
I bought the boat in February of 93 and almost a year had passed and I'm you know working on getting the boat ready to, to move because I was going to move it I wanted to move it to the, to the Stockton Delta area because then I could live on it and then commute to work on the research farm and uh, so I um, I went ahead and um, was in Santa Cruz working on it one day and my neighbor Lee opens up his companionway hatch and sticks his head out and he goes, um, so when's your lease up? And I go, what do you mean? He goes, the lease to the slip, when's it up? And and I go, I, I don't understand what you're talking about. When's, what do you mean, when's it up? He goes, there's a waiting list in here. It's eight years, an eight year waiting list to get a slip in the upper harbor here. He goes, you know, they're gonna kick you out. And it was like, um, I think it was January, December or January when he told me this. So basically he goes, yeah, they're going to kick you out. You only, you can only keep a boat in here for one year. If you buy a boat in here, you, you're allowed to keep it one year and then you have to get it out of here. And it's like, great. I wasn't even close to getting ready to move this boat. And so he, um, he told me, you know, I said, it's in February. He goes, yeah, they're going to kick you out. So I had one month now to get that boat out of there. Well, I didn't make it. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't ready. So I talked to the, I talked to uh, the harbor master and my neighbor Lee ended up moving his boat to the other side of the marina. So his slip was open. So I, I told my, told the harbor master, I go, the slip next to me is open. Um, and he goes, and somebody wanted my slip. They were, were on the waiting list and they, they were ready to move in. So what had happened was I didn't get my boat out in time. And the person that was on the waiting list to move in to the slip, he was a real high profile, famous lawyer. And I was trying to get the boat ready to get it out, to get it moved and get out of there. And I still had a ways to go. And I get back to the research farm late at night, like two in the morning. And there was like seven messages on the answering machine at the research farm. And it's this lawyer guy. And he's threatening me, he's gonna sue me, he's gonna destroy my life, he's gonna do everything, everything but pretty much kill me if I don't get that boat out of there like tomorrow. So I called the harbor master the next day and said, the slip next to me is open, can you just move it out of my slip and move it to the slip next to my slip and temporarily until, we can, until I can figure out what I can do? He goes, yeah, we can do that. So he moved me into the other slip. And when I, I was down there, some people came up to me and said, do you know who's moving into this slip? And I go, yeah, I go, it's that boat down there. He, no, the guy, the, do, the um, lawyer had his boat in dry dock. And the guy, this guy came up to me and says, I was on the waiting list for that slip. And somebody bumped me. He goes, he goes I don't know what happened, but that was supposed to be my slip. And I told him, I go, well, the guy that's moving in here is a high profile lawyer. And so this other guy was really upset because evidently the high, the high profile lawyer guy slipped some money to the harbor master to jump in front of this other guy and get the slip that I was in. And so at any rate, I, um, so I moved into the other slip. The harbor master says, you can't stay there because people, there's a, someone wants that slip too. Our master says, what I can do is I can put you on an end tie. And he told me the thing about being on an end tie now, and because I'm not supposed to be in there, he goes, the rent's going to go up by $100 a month every month you're here. And it was still going to be a few months, several months. Actually, I was thinking more like five, six months before I was ready to get out of there. So I ended up being, I think, three extra months. I was on an end tie. They tied me on to an end tie. Then... He said that now that you're on an end tie, we do allow boats to raft up to your boat. So I'm on the end tie. Now they allowed a boat to raft up to my boat. That means the guy on this boat has to crawl over my boat to get on the dock and then back across my boat to get back onto his boat. Then they rafted another boat up to his boat. So now I got other people now that crawling over my boat. And so that's where I was at. And so I had to get out of there. So I got everything together, got it all together. And I was going to have my friend Brett go with me. And I decided I'm just going to 
because I was taking so much time off from work. I really couldn't take any more time off from work. And I wanted to sail the boat from Santa Cruz up to the Delta. So I went up to the Delta to get a slip in the Delta. And again, this was in 94. And I went to all these marinas and they all required insurance. And I go, well, okay, fine, I'll get insurance. So I go to get insurance and I start calling insurance companies. First thing they asked me was about what kind of boat do I have? Well, it turns out it's not a production boat. It wasn't built in a, in a factory. It was a home-built boat. A guy built it, I guess, probably in his yard. And he did a good job. The builder did a good job. He's a cabinet maker. So it was a nice boat. It was really nice. Um, and uh, so no insurance company would talk to me because it was not a production boat. It was a home-built boat. And they say, we don't cover those. The only insurance company that quoted a quote was Allstate. $615 a month for insurance if I wanted it insured. And it's like, you got to be kidding me. And so there's no way I could afford that. So now I don't have insurance and no Marine is going to let me in. Interesting thing was Santa Cruz Harbor did not require insurance at the time. So my neighbor, Lee, kept telling me, go to San Leandro Marina. Go to San... It's, it's, they just did a bunch of rebuild to it. The, they upgraded it. They got a... Uh, just go there. And uh, I didn't even know where San Leandro was at. And uh, so I looked... I had charts, and I looked at my charts, and I saw it on the chart. And I thought, okay, I'll go there. And uh, I had to get out of Santa Cruz. So I just thought, I'm just going to... I'm going to go up into the San Francisco Bay... I'll go to San Leandro first to see if they, I, I didn't even call them. I just thought I'm, I got to get the boat out. I got to move out of Santa Cruz. So I'm just going to go up to the bay. And so I, um, I had to go under a bridge to get out of Santa Cruz Harbor. That means lowering my mask down to get under. And when I bought the boat, I didn't even notice the, I, I mean, I went across that bridge, but I didn't put two and two together that, I have to lower the mask down to get up to the bridge. And uh, so, and the previous owner was, you know, telling me about the tabernacle rig and there's a power winch in the back electric winch with a stainless steel cable. And he showed me how to lower the thing down. Then I figured out, okay, I got to lower this mask down to get under the bridge. So, um, so at any rate, that's no big deal. I can do that, I figure. So when I was leaving Santa Cruz, my friend Brett was going to go with me. And uh, Lee helped us to get under the bridge. So he brought his little inflatable dinghy with his outboard on it to kind of tie it on the back of my boat. And we, that way he can get back to his boat when we got under the bridge. And um, so I go to, I thought, okay, I'm going to go ahead and lower the mast down while I'm at the, on the end tie. I was still tied to the dock. And just that way I don't have to deal with it out in the water with the engine running and all that. And uh, I had a hard time getting the engine started, by the way. It was a used Lehman diesel engine, and the previous owner said, uh, I can't guarantee that this thing's going to run. And that was a, another big challenge. And I go to get it, try to start it, and it wouldn't start, and wouldn't start, and wouldn't start. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm, I'm screwed. And uh, finally, I figured out that the linkage for the throttle, which I had to put all this together, there was two levers on the um, inject, injection injector pump. And the... I attach it to one lever, which was the throttle lever, but the other lever was the kill, the quick kill switch to shut the engine off. So what it does is just shuts the fuel off. So no, shuts the fuel off, the engine stops running. Well, I didn't connect that together to the to the linkage, so that's why the engine wouldn't start. And once I figured that out, I thought, what's this lever for? And I started cranking the engine, and I reached down there and I pulled on that lever. The engine, the engine just started right up. Ran great. The engine ran great. So everything was good there. So at any rate, so then uh, I was leaving. I, I went to lower the, the mast down. I'm on the end tie. Now these boats that were rafted up to me were gone by now. And so I was just on the end tie. But there was a boat on the end tie in front of me. And it was a really nice boat. So I start lowering my mast down. And there was these two cables on each side that connected to the shrouds part way up, about mm, four feet up high. So the shrouds actually had stainless steel flat bar, two of them on each side. 
two, two on one side and two on the other. And then the stainless steel cable for the shroud is attached to those flat bars. And the reason for those flat bars is I have to hook these two cables to the flat, to the top of the flat bars coming back to the back of the boat because that's where the, the, the mast hinges and it has to hinge the, where the shroud is at the same height. And the previous owner made these stainless steel cables. I mean, he had all the fancy stainless steel fittings and everything. Well, I started lowering the mast down and one of those side cables broke and boom, and my mast started swinging. It was swinging right over this really expensive boat. So me and Brett, we untied the bow line and I pushed my boat over, still tied to the dock. So if that, if my mast fell, it wasn't going to fall on that boat in front of me. It would just fall into the water. And, uh, and then I was able to, um, so I, 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 what I did is I got a rope and I just tied a rope to it instead of that fancy stainless steel cable. And I lowered, uh, I lowered it all the way down and got it down. So that was good. So then I thought, okay, I'm just going to use that rope when I hoist it back up. And what I should have done was when it replaced the cable on the other side with the rope. Because stainless, fancy stainless steel fittings, as cool as they are, can fail. But if you know how to tie knots... Not a, a good bowl and knot ain't going to fail. And uh, and uh, it held, you know, fine when I got the mast down. So when I went under the bridge, so me and Brett and Lee was on my boat. I went under the bridge and I started to hoist the mast back up, started hoisting it up. The, the cable on this side broke. Bam! This time the mast fell all the way down. And there was a notch on the pulpit in the front where the, when you lower it down, it, it, the mast lowers down in this notch. Well because this broke on this side, the mast kind of went over this way and it missed the pulpit completely and it went right down over, smashed my lifelines and the mast was down hanging in the water. And when it fell, it ripped the gooseneck off the boom that my boom attaches. Here's the mast and here's the boom. It literally ripped the boom off of the mast completely. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm out. I mean, I'm running out of money here I and I got to get out of here. And Lee goes, well, Take it over to the bow yard over there, and they got a crane, and they can hoist your mast up. And I go, I, I can't afford that. I got, I don't have time, and I can't, I can't be doing that. So I'm th sitting there thinking, what am I gonna do? And so, I, um, I pulled up to the fuel dock, and that's where I was at. And these guys come by in a dinghy, and they help lift the mast up out of the water. There's four of us lifting this mast out. We got it up on into the slot on the bow. And so where it belongs. And so I started thinking, okay, if I can use the power winch in the back that I used to lower the mast down, I have the, the cable, on, when you lower the mast down, here's the boom, here's the mast. The, there, there's the topping lift, which is the cable that goes to the, to the boom, the back of the boom. You attach the stainless steel cable that goes to the winch, power winch to the, to there, to the end of the boom. And that way you can, you can lift the mast up. That's how you lift and lower it, but it has to be attached to the back of the boom. And the boom has to be attached to the mast. So I figured if I can attach the boom back to the mast, then I can go ahead and raise the mast back up. Well, that was going to require a lot of pounding with a hammer because every the, the gooseneck was all bent up and it's getting dark. And of course it's a marina and there's people living in there. Well, I was next to this restaurant that had a bar and a dance floor, and they had a salsa band playing. And they played all night. And so <laughs> what I did, I was out there with my hammer, just pounding away, making all this noise. And so what I ended up doing to try to kind of camouflage my hammer pounding sound was I pounded to the <laughs> music of the band. And I just kept in time with the band, you know? And that's what I did. And uh, nobody complained. So uh, I know I was making a lot of noise, but the band was real loud too. So I just pounded to, along with the music all night. I was up all night, no sleep. And I was up the night before getting ready. So no sleep. So now it's two nights without sleep. So first thing in the morning, when, when the mast broke off that night, it was evening because we were going to do a night run up the coast. And the reason for the night run was when I got up to to the Golden Gate Bridge, I wanted to enter the bay in the daytime. If I would have left in the morning in Santa Cruz, I would have got to the San Francisco Bay at night. I didn't want to come in at night. I wanted to come in in the day. And that's the reason I decided to do a night run. I wanted to sail, which would have taken me a few days because you're fighting the current and you have to go way out. The wind direction is all wrong. It's, and so it would have taken me probably three days to sail to the San Francisco Bay. 
So I decided I'm just going to motor and just try to do it all, you know, overnight. Well, because the mast failure happened with the tabernacle rig and the cable breaking, my friend Brett, who was going to go with me, first thing he does is he goes, runs to the payphone. People didn't have cell phones in those days, not too many around. Goes to a payphone, calls up his friend Danny and says, come over and pick me up. I'm not going with him. His mast just broke off and I ain't going with it. And so the, ne the next morning I was up all night pounding. Brett was there. He was trying to sleep and I was couldn't. And I was, I actually, the next day Danny come to pick him up. Well, Brett goes, come on, let's go. Let's get out of here. Danny goes, no, I want to watch and see if Tom can, can get the mast back up. So they stayed there all day. And, um, and so I was able to attach the boom to the mast and I was able to lift the mast back up. And the, uh, so I got the, I got the mast up and Brett wasn't going to go with me. He was at this point, he was scared and, and going with Tom. No way. Am I going to go out in the ocean, the Pacific ocean with him? And I, I, and I had no choice. So it looks like I'm going by myself. Now this is going to be a third night with no sleep by myself. And so what I did was I, and Brett, he's a big guy and he's, you know, a tough guy. So I started calling him a chicken you chicken, you chicken. And that did it. He, all right, I'll go. So, and he kept telling me, I've been all the way to Chile on a fishing boat, Tom, and one hour out, you're going to be seasick and throwing up. And one hour out and we left. And right before we left, we were actually the, the harbor master that next morning, moved my boat off the fuel dock. because People had to get fuel and moved me over to a commercial fishing dock. Well, this big commercial fishing boat came in, husband and wife team. And it was seven, it was, it was actually Mother's Day in 1994, Sunday. And the sun was getting, setting, it was like seven o'clock in the evening. Had my engine running, had the mast back up. This fishing boat pulls in and the captain of the fishing boat goes, are you going out now? And I go, yes. He goes, don't go out now. It's too rough out there. Don't go. I just told him, I ain't got no choice. I have to go. I ain't got no choice. So me and Brett left and we started motoring out. And one hour out, Brett goes, I'm going to go lay down. Well, his, he did hurt his back, lifting the mast up on to my boat. His back was hurting. So he was going to go up in the V berth in the front of the boat. And that's where he'd been sleeping when he was staying with me on the boat. And I have, I had quarter berths on the boat that were farther back towards the cockpit companionway door. There was two quarter berths on each side. And I slept in one side. And I told him, just go ahead and take my bunk. Because I'm going to be up all night anyway, so, you know, motoring this boat out the up the coast and I, I and and the reason i told him to take my bunk was because if he was up in the v berth going over these big waves and they were big i mean we were encountering 30 foot waves out there and he he would have been he would have been seasick throwing up so and i didn't want him sick throwing up in my boat so i told him just take take my bunk because it's farther back and you know less movement if you're up in the front of the boat you're going to be like this trying to sleep but in the back you're more like that so he did, and he, he stayed down there all night. <laughs> and so, so I was up for three nights, no sleep, and I motored up the coast, and it was freaking awesome. The waves were huge, and the engine ran great. And because um, all the experience I had in my little small dinghies sailing in reservoirs in smaller waves, uh, these big, big, huge waves in the Pacific Ocean, I did. I was not scared at all. I mean, I was totally comfortable, not even nervous. Cool part was we hit it just the right time when we had uh, the algae in the water. At certain times of the year, you get this, the, oh, there's a name for it, where the water glows. Like when the, when the waves come up on the beach, when the water gets excited, you know, stirred up, it literally glows green. And the boat, uh, because of the time of the year, the, the algae that's in the water, I had uh, this afterglow. It's called afterglow behind the boat. And the whole boat was lit up, going through the water, motoring through the water. You know, the water's coming up around the boat, getting pushed out of the way. The, the water just lit up this bright green. It's like a built-in swimming pool with the light turned on at night. And the whole boat was just lit up. And you could see the afterglow was all the way to the horizon behind the boat, just glowing green. And it was just the coolest thing. And um, so we were doing good. I had the stern light. I had the, I had the running lights on. So the red and green on the bow and the stern light, which is a white light. And every, 
I was in the cockpit and about every 20 minutes I'd stand up and look 360 degrees for other traffic. And one of the times I got up and I stood up and I looked around and I see this boat, I see red and green coming right at me. And we see red and green together, that means the boat's heading right towards you. And uh, there's a big boat heading right towards us. And so I'm thinking he doesn't see my stern light or if he sees it, he thinks it's maybe a light on shore or something, but he's, he's steering right from my stern light. And so I told Brett, I go, go turn my spreader lights on, which the mast has spreaders part way up about a little more than halfway. There's these like spreaders that hold the shroud, the cables out. So they're like wooden or actually fiberglass spreaders that's and there, there's lights on that light up the deck of your boat so you can light up the deck of your boat and see so they're way up on the mast and they're like car headlights but they shine down and i told brett to turn the spreader lights on this guy can't see me can't see us and so he was on the electrical panels flipping every switch and he could not get the spreader lights to come on so i had to leave the helm and actually i had a tiller on this boat and uh no autopilot or anything so i had to run down in the boat and turn the spreader lights on. And I turned the spreader lights on, I ran back out in the cockpit, and the guy, then he saw what was going on, and it was a big, big, huge trawler. And uh, he damn near hit us. He, he turned just if, I mean, he was within feet. If, if I hadn't got the spreader lights on, he would have ran us over. He would have ran us right, we would have been dead. And uh, so that was nerve wracking, and so, um, then the rest of the trip was pretty good. Um, we got up to Half Moon Bay and the sun was coming up and, um, I, um, that was another thing is in Half Moon Bay, there's a reef out there that's like a big circular reef and cause Half Moon Bay is Half Moon shape. And so the fishing boats, they drag nets and they follow each other. And so there'll be one fishing boat and he's dragging a big long net for a long ways and then the next boat would be right behind his net dragging a net and so on and so on so these all these boats are going in a big circle and I didn't want to go farther offshore <laughs> so, so I cut through them and um, I, I thought I was going to make it in front of this boat this fishing boat that was dragging a net and I noticed that I wasn't going to make it and he started flashing his lights at me and so I turned and I went this way past him and I knew not to cut behind his boat because I knew he had a net back there and it was going to get in my prop. And so I went way, way, way down, way, 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 way down. Then I cut across and I got around. <laughs> my friend Brett goes, you better look for bullet holes. He's probably shooting at you. And, uh, but uh, at any rate, so the sun started coming up and um, Coast Guard helicopter flew over and buzzed us right over my boat, real low. And um, then... We got up to the Golden Gate Bridge and motoring, and it was 11 o'clock in the morning. And my friend Brett was still down below. And I told him, I go, Brett, get up here. I need you to steer the boat because I want to put the sails up. We're going to sail under the Golden Gate. And he goes, just motor in. I go, no. I go, after all of this, I am sailing this boat under sail under the Golden Gate Bridge into the San Francisco Bay. So I finally got him to get up there and get on the helm. And I raised up the sails. And uh, there's a wind right on our stern. And so I set the sails out wing and wing, downwind, and shut the engine off. And oh, what a nice feeling that was. No more noisy diesel engine. It was just nice and quiet. You can hear the water under the boat and gentle breeze. It wasn't blowing very hard, but it was enough to, to make us move. And uh, sailed under the Golden Gate. And... Um, Interesting thing was in when I was in Half Moon Bay, I saw the fishing boats and I was starting to get hungry. And I thought, oh, I know, I want a tuna sandwich. So I tied off the tiller and I went down below and I made coffee. And it was, the, going over those waves are so huge that when you get to the crest of the wave, the boat get to the crest of the wave and go over the wave, you'd actually become almost completely weightless in the boat. I mean, you'd weighed like nothing. You were like light as a feather. And then you, the boat would go over the wave. And then when you got to the, down to the trough of the wave, you weighed like, it felt like you weighed 400 pounds. And then you, and this is motoring and punching into the waves. I'm literally punching into them. And then you get to the next wave and then you'd be weightless. 
and then you'd be 400 pounds and then weightless and then 400 pounds. Well, this went on for the whole way up in the Pacific Ocean. So it really wears you out. And so when I was trying to make coffee, I was like spread eagle with my legs behind me, one hand holding onto the counter, and I can only use one hand to make coffee. And <laughs> it was very difficult. And 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 then I went ahead and I made I made some tuna too. Well, I was done because I was hungry and made a tuna sandwich. Well, I took the can of tuna and I squeezed the tuna juice out of the can into a cranberry um ocean spray cranberry drink bottle it still had some cranberry juice in it right and i didn't know what to do with the with the um you know i didn't have a sink in the galley yet i had the galley and i had the sink in but i didn't have it plumbed in so i just went ahead and poured the tuna juice out of the tuna can squeezed it into this ocean spray jar bottle and uh Somehow that bottle with the ocean spray ended up back in the cockpit. Well, I had another ocean spray bottle that I was drinking out of, but I didn't put the tuna juice in. Well, well, right when we got under the Golden Gate Bridge, I picked up that one with the tuna juice in it, thinking it was the one that didn't have the tuna juice in it. And I took a big swallow out of it and I spit it out. And my friend was like scrambling for the camera. He, he wanted to get a picture of me um, and then he could tell, look, Tom was seasick and he, he was uh, vomiting blood because the ocean sprayed cranberry juice is red, right? And, uh, but uh, yeah, so I spit it out, but uh, uh, that was interesting. But um, he didn't get a picture, by the way, but, uh, and I was not seasick. I wasn't seasick the whole way. I've only been seasick once on a boat and that was a fishing boat out of Monterey, but I've never been seasick on a sailboat ever. And um, so... At any rate, we sailed in uh, to um, under the Golden Gate Bridge, and it was starting to get late, and his Danny was going to pick us up. I told him he was going to pick us up in San Leandro because we didn't have a car there. And then he was going to give us a ride back to Modesto, and then I was going to have my sister and her husband give me a ride back to Santa Cruz to get my truck. And uh, so I thought, we got to get in. It's, 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 uh, we were under sail. We sailed under the Golden Gate, and we sailed under the Oakland Bay Bridge. And my friend Brett didn't know how to sail, never sailed a boat in his life. And I was just dead tired. And uh, so there, there was a nice breeze, but not too much. And so he was under sail. And so I told him, I got, I got to take a nap. I go, and he didn't want to sail the boat. He was really nervous about it because he'd never sailed before. So I got him on the tiller. I just told him, keep the compass on the setting and watch for traffic. Wake me up no matter what it is, anything you're worried about, wake me up. So I go in, I lay down on my bunk and the water's swishing under the boat and being awake for three days, three nights. I was exhausted and the sound of the water into the boat just ah oh, and we're under sail and it was just so quiet and peaceful and I fell asleep for like 20 minutes best sleep I ever had in my life 20 minutes into this sleep all of a sudden I hear Brett hey Tom we're getting run over I come crawling out I look up and there's this Dutch freighter and it's coming right down on us fast and it was close and there wasn't a lot of wind, so we weren't moving fast enough to get out of its way. And he goes, I waited till the last minute to wake you up. I didn't want to wake you up. And I go, you shouldn't have done that. You should have woke me up immediately. And luckily, the engine had started. I started the engine. It started right up, luckily. And I motored out of the way. Barely made it out of the way. That's twice now on this trip. I almost got ran over. Oh, and by the way, when I got in under the Golden Gate, as soon as I got in under the Golden Gate, the Coast Guard, when I was in San Francisco Bay, that same Coast Guard helicopter came over and buzzed us again, right over my boat, real low. And I think what happened was the harbor master in Santa Cruz notified the Coast Guard when I left because I had problems getting out of the marina. He knew it. And he told the Coast Guard to keep an eye on us. Evidently, that's what that was about. So, um, because they weren't buzzing other people. <laughs> just us. And uh, I think basically they probably just, once I got into San Francisco Bay, they buzzed us and then notified the harbor master in Santa Cruz that I had made it into the San Francisco Bay. And um, so it's um, now, this is Monday, the day after Mother's Day, 1994. So I'm, I'm driving in to San Leandro Marina. Never been there. Didn't talk to the harbor master there yet. Every marina I checked that I was trying to get into wanted insurance. I couldn't get insurance. So that means there was no place to put my boat. The whole way up the, the night run up the coast, the whole night, that was, that's the only thing I worried about. 
I, you know, nothing else really bothered me, but other than I'm probably going to lose my book because I'm going to find a place to put it. And then what am I going to do with it if I can't put it somewhere? I mean, it's just really kind of too big to trailer. Um, and uh, it could be put on a big low boy with a wide load. And, but, you know, I, I couldn't afford all that. And uh, so uh, we told Danny Lake, I told him, we'll be there at five, which you can't predict what time you're going to arrive somewhere on a boat. It's impossible. But I told him, he got off work. He worked in Hayward. He lived in the Modesto community to the area every day. And uh, he, um, we told him, we'll, we'll try to be there at five o'clock. And so we started, we were heading towards, we, by the time we started the engine, get out of the way of that Dutch freighter, I just left the engine running because I thought we need to get there. And so we murdered the rest of the way about the sails in and murdered the rest of the way. And as we're approaching San Leandro Marina, my friend Brett goes, hey, there's Danny. I go, where? He goes, look, he's that red dot over there. He's got a San Francisco uh, 49er shirt on. And uh, he was standing on the jetty watching us come in. And we arrived into the San Leandro Marina right at five o'clock. Just like what, what I said, I couldn't believe we made it perfectly on time. The har I pulled up to the fuel dock and the harbor master came down to the fuel dock. And he goes, you picked a fine time. And I go, what, you don't have any slips available? He goes, oh, I got a lot of slips available. He goes, it's five o'clock. I was getting ready to go home. He goes, go on up, fill out the paperwork. I got it on the, on the counter. Just fill it out. And he goes, I'm going to measure your boat. So uh, I, I'm walking up there and I'm thinking, why does he got paperwork out? How does he know I'm just not coming in to get fuel? I mean, I could just be coming in to fuel my boat up and leave. And so I started thinking about it, and the harbor master in Santa Cruz asked me what my next port of call was going to be, and I said San Leandro Marina. So I think what he did was he called the harbor master in San Leandro and told him that we we're on our way to, to um, expect us to be arriving there. So I get up, and I'm, so I'm walking up to the marina office. I'm thinking, they're going to want insurance, and I'm not going to be able to get in here. And the, the agreement in Santa Cruz, when I filled out the agreement, if you held this agreement up and it was in quadruplet, <laughs> there's like four copies of it. If you held this agreement up while you're standing up, it went all the way to the floor with all these stipulations. But they didn't want insurance in Santa Cruz, which was a trip. Okay. So now I get up to, I go up to the harbor office. I'm in there by myself and there's paperwork on to, on the counter. And I'm expecting this great big form that I have to fill out, you know. No, it was just a little card. It wanted my name, phone number, address, you know, name of my boat, the CF number, whatever. I think it was all that they wanted. Didn't say anything about insurance and I sure in the hell wasn't going to bring it up. So um, he told me, and in Santa Cruz, I was paying like over $400 a month. I was not a living aboard cost more to live aboard. So it was 400. And then when I was on the end tight, went up to 500 the next month, 600 the month after that. Finally, I got out of there. And um, so I, um, the harbor master came back up to the office and I filled out the paperwork, gave it to him. And he goes, he goes, well, one good thing is, you know, this, this Marine is owned by the city of San Leandro and they just had a meeting and they just raised the price for the slips in here. And it's like, oh, great. They just raised the price. Because well, that's a good thing because now the price ain't going to go up for a very long time. And I, he goes, he goes, he showed me a map of the marina. He goes, pick up over here on H stock. He goes, just pick out one of the slips in the middle. There's a bunch of empty slips. Just pick one out, move the boat in there. So it was a 44 foot slip. And uh, so I asked him, well, how much a month is the 44 foot slip going to cost? And I'm expecting, you know, four or 500 bucks. He said, um, it's $176 a month. <laughs> it's like, I couldn't believe it. No, they didn't require insurance. The rent's only $176 a month. Are you kidding me? And so, uh, so I went ahead and uh, I pulled the boat in to the slip. Danny went with me on when I moved from the fuel dock into the, into the uh, slip because he, he wanted to go for a little boat ride. He didn't go with us on the night run. So Brett, he, Brett moved Danny's truck, his car, over to the, to the, where the, H stock was and Danny got on the boat with me. So I'm pulling the boat in to the slip. And that was probably the most nerve wracking part. Really the whole trip is just making sure I don't hit anything getting into the slip. First time I moved a boat that big into a slip and, um, and, and almost hit the pier post, but I mean, I missed it by an inch, but I pulled it right in. And as I'm pulling in 
all these empty slips on each dock. There was one boat on the end tie, and on the other end of this dock was a big sailboat, um, beautiful sailboat on the other end, and no boats in between. So there was only three boats on this entire dock. And uh, the sailboat was on the side tie, which is the end, it's not the end tie, it's the opposite end of the deck, it's by the parking lot. And it's turned in to this slip down there. And as I'm driving my boat in, I'm looking at the sailboat down there. And I said, oh my God, what a beautiful boat. Someday I'm going to own a boat like that. Well, 20 years later, I bought that boat. And that's the boat I'm sitting on right now. And uh, so, at any rate, but getting back to after moving the boat into San Leandro Marina. Um, the... Um, I, I left. I left for the, uh, for you know. I left the boat there that night. Tied it off. The next weekend, I went back, and Brett went with me. And uh, so he went back with me, and we drove back over. And Santa Cruz from Modesto, Santa Cruz, it was a two-hour. It's like two hours and fifteen minutes to get there. I take Highway Seventeen um, to Santa Cruz, so I go through the Bay Area, San Jose. Um, that was the faster way to get there. And uh, so I, um, so we went over, I couldn't believe it when we went to, now I don't have to drive to Santa Cruz, now I just drive to San Leandro. And so from the research farm, which was where I was living at the time, uh, it was only an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, I couldn't believe it, so that was great. And um, so the commute wasn't that bad. And so uh, we went over and spent the weekend on it and then uh, came back and so I'd go over on the weekends and so so this was in May when I moved it to San Leandro so September rolls around and I was over I was over on the boat by myself and I got up Monday morning to go back to the research farm to go back to work and uh, so I was just checking things out and you know, making sure the boat was secure and uh, I went into the head and I opened up the cabinet so I had a I had a, a through-hole fitting in there, and I just want to check all the through-hole fittings and make sure nothing's leaking. And I open up the cabinet, and I look down, and I see some paint that was chipping on the hull, on, on the stringer. It was a part of the framing uh, on the bottom of the boat. And I thought, well, that doesn't look good. And I didn't have time to, to check it, so I went ahead, and I thought, okay, I'll check it when I, uh, when I get back. Uh, maybe the next weekend I'll come back and I'll check it. And, uh, and see what's up with that chipped paint. So the following weekend, I think it was the following weekend, I went back over there and I noticed this little shelf that was sitting on top of that stringer. And it was just a little piece of plywood and I didn't notice it when I, when I did my own survey. I kind of inspected the boat myself before I bought it and I was looking for a dry rot and I was poking it everywhere around. Well, I lifted this little shelf thing off, which I can't believe I didn't notice it, but I didn't notice it. It was so small. It was just like a couple inches wide. And, and I lifted it up. And the paint on the hole was chipped too a little bit and on that stringer. Well, I took my awl and I pushed into the, to the plywood because the boat's made out of plywood. And it's fiberglass on the outside. So I was thinking, eh, it's got fiberglass on there. And I pushed the awl in to the wood and I pulled it out and water started squirting in. It was actually, I pushed the awl into the wood and it was below the water line by about a half an inch below the water line. If I'd have been higher up, water wouldn't have came in. But so now I pulled the awl out and water squirting in my boat. And it's like, oh my God, what am I going to do? And the wood was so soft, I could literally poke my finger through the hull of the boat there. So it was a long strip of dry rot. The frame was rotted and the plywood on the hull itself was rotted just above. And it wasn't up very high, but it was a little ways up, you know, a couple inches up, it was dry rot. And the fiberglass didn't do anything. It was like rotted too. So the all went right through it. So that means my finger would poke right through it. I could poke a hole with my finger right through the hole of this boat. Always get a survey and never buy a wood boat. Okay. Um, another, so what am I going to do? Well, luckily I had some epoxy putty. So I kneaded it up, you know, mixed it to plug up that little hole that I poked through there. And I had to be careful when I pushed that epoxy putty in there because I didn't want to make a bigger hole in my finger. So I was very careful and I got the leak to stop. And then I'm thinking, oh my God, this boat's a piece of junk. What am I going to do now? 
And prior to that, before I left Santa Cruz, this is another thing I missed that you should get a survey. Now, it doesn't mean a surveyor would catch this, but probably would. I noticed after I bought the boat, a pile that was shaped like a pyramid that looked like ground pepper. And, but it was like a kind of a cone shape, pyramid shape of pepper, ground pepper. And it was quite a bit. And I showed it to my friend Lee. I go, do you know what this is? And he goes, oh my God, you got termites. And I go, termites on a boat? How can a boat get termites? And he goes, I don't know, but he goes, that, that, that's termite crap. And, they, and so I went to the, I got back to Modesto. I went to the library. This is before I, I, this is before I even moved the boat out of Santa Cruz. And I, I started doing research on uh, termites and pretty interesting. Um, yes, there's a termite nest and there's different types of termites in that nest. There's soldier termites. And I think they have like a queen, like a queen bee. And then they, then they have like worker termites. Um, and then they have these, these other termites and I can't remember what they're called. They, they, but they have wings, certain, certain termites inside the nest. Some of them don't have wings. Some of them do have wings. They're like, I think they're called explorer termites and they come out of the nest and then they fly around looking to start a new colony somewhere. And that's how they get on a boat because they can fly. And when they find a place that they want to start a colony, what these termites actually do is they jump up in the air, flip upside down and land on their backs and they'll break their wings off. So now they can start boring into the wood and crawl into the wood. So they, they literally break their wings off. And I did notice on my boat in Santa Cruz, insect wings. And a lot of times I think that's a spider ate, a, ate an insect and they won't eat the wings. And um, same thing with, you ever see black widow legs? When a um, black widow's mate, the female will bite the male after they mate and kill the male and then she eats the male. And I've seen black widow legs before and it's just legs. And I know they're black widow legs because they you can tell. And I've seen them at the research farm and stuff. And I always wondered about that. Well, that's what that's about. So that's pretty kinky stuff. So, um, yeah. So I had found some termite wings on the boat previous. But um, so I uh, now I had to deal with termites. And that was before I left Santa Cruz. So what I did there is I researched it and found out that termites, they're like ants. And they, when they pass each other, they like kiss. And they do that for a reason because they have like saliva and they transmit the saliva between them. And the saliva has an enzyme in it that helps them break down the wood when they eat it. And so they have to kiss each other all the time to keep this enzyme going. And so if you poison one termite, when they go kiss the other termites, they pass the poison off to the other termites. So that's, so you only need to, to poison like one or two termites and you can kill the whole colony like that. So I got this stuff that was for electronics, but it was, they were used, it can be used to kill termites. And it, it was in a spray can. It had this little rubber tube and it had this little pin hole, like a needle, um, like a, a hypodermic needle on it, the end of the, this little tube, flexible tube, and it had like, looked like a little suction cup. And so you, you find where they, the termites, what they do is when they dump their crap out, they have to get it out of the nest. So they dump it out. And that's what made, it looks like ground pepper. It's just wood that they digested. And so what they do and why it was in a pyramid shape was they, it was underneath the cockpit is where they were at in my boat. And they, they'll bore a hole out and then they push the crap out on, out of the hole and it, it piled up. And, and, and so the pyramid, the point of that pyramid straight up, look up, I saw this hole. Well, one of the soldier termites stands at that hole and puts his head in the hole of that hole that they make and just stays there. So no, no, Intruders can get into the nest because there are ants that can kill termites. They'll get into the nest and they'll kill the termites. The ants will. And that's one way of getting rid of termites is you can get the certain breed of ants and they'll go into the termite nest and kill them. And then once they eat all the termites, then they run out of food and then the ants die. And um, but um, so one of the soldier termites will stick his head in that hole to keep anything from getting into the nest. So I just went ahead and poked that hypodermic needle on that spray can and I sprayed this stuff in there and I could see the wood getting wet and so I can see where the nest is, you know, like then I see it coming out of other holes where they had drilled and they were dumping out crap. And uh, so I 
killed off most of them, but that's a temporary thing because there's eggs and stuff that'll probably hatch out and then they'll be termites back again. That's why you can really never get rid of them. But I found out an interesting thing about termites and how important they are to nature. They break down trees that die and stuff. So they're a very important part of nature. Um, and um, basically pulverize the trees back into, so they go back into the soil. And uh, so at any rate, getting back to the dry rot, um, well, I was in San Leandro now. So I went up the coast and I wasn't sure because I'd been in San Leandro for six months and I wasn't sure if that dry rot was there when I left Santa Cruz and I was out in 30 foot waves in the Pacific Ocean with dry rot at all. I don't know. It may have happened after I'd moved because I, I think I would have seen it on that stringer for sure because I poked every inch of that boat I could when I was before I bought it. So I'm thinking it might have happened afterwards. Uh, dry rot can happen pretty quick. And so, I, um, so I'm thinking, what am I going to do? This boat's, it's ruined. It's total, it's a mess. I mean, I, I can't even, I can't, I'm not going to sell it to somebody like this. You know, I can't even sell it. You know, what am I going to do? So I researched it and found out there's this product. Uh, it's penetrating epoxy and it's a company called Get Rot and it's for uh, rotted wood on boats. So it's for treating dry rot. And so what you do is you, if you have a piece of wood that's rotted, you drill a bunch of holes in it, not all the way through, but just into it. And the wood's gonna be real soft because it's rotted. Then you take this epoxy, two-part epoxy, and it comes in this little, you put it in this little squeeze bottle, and there's two parts, and you put in the resin and the, the uh, activator, the hardener, and you shake it up real good. And then, and then you just squirt the, the squeeze bottle. It's kind of like a mustard bottle or ketchup bottle. And you um, got all these holes now drilled part way into the wood, and then you squeeze the epoxy into the holes. You start at the bottom and you work your way up. And the the dry rotted wood is like a sponge, and it just soaks that epoxy up. And then the epoxy cures, and it's it's actually, I think it's actually stronger than the wood itself after it cures. It's super strong. I even took some of the get rot, put it in a Ziploc bag after I mixed it up, and just put some in the bottom and let it cure. And it was really flexible that I couldn't tear it or bend it or break it. So it, it's super strong. So actually that part of the boat that was dry rotted was probably the strongest part of the boat after I treated it with the epoxy. Um, even stronger than all the rest of the wood that wasn't, didn't have dry rot. And um, so, uh, yeah, so that's what I did. So I lived on the boat and uh, I was working on the research farm and I didn't have I was so busy working and I didn't have a lot of time to get over to the boat on the weekends, just on the weekends occasionally. And I, I didn't have going months before, before I go over to check on the boat. And uh, so I had the boat for several years and I never uh, took it out. They didn't, they dredged the marina once in San Leandro and then they stopped dredging it and the channel started to silt up. And so you can only get in and out at high tide. And, um, uh, the engine had a problem. Uh, I couldn't get it started um, after I got to San Leandro. It sat for a while and I couldn't get it started. Well, it turned out it was this uh, this little electronic box um, that was for the, uh, it activated the glow plugs basically is what it did. And it, it wasn't working and I couldn't get the engine to start. And I, I traced the problem to that box. And so I just bypassed the box, got rid of it. And I just put a switch in, a, a momentary contact switch for the glow plug so I can hold it in for like 20 seconds to heat up the glow plugs and start the engine. And then the engine started, it started to run. So any rate, so then uh, I quit the farm and moved over onto my boat. And, and um, so that was in um, 2006. And I took, I took the dog that, from the farm because my boss wasn't going to take care of this dog that he got. It ended up being my dog. And uh, so I, I took the dog, me and the dog moved onto my boat and was living on my boat and I got a job over in the Bay Area. And uh, so after a couple of years, my dog died. And um, so I continued living on my boat. And that, uh, but at uh, any rate, that sailboat that was on the end of the dock when I first moved to San Leandro, that beautiful sailboat that I said, one day I'm going to buy a boat like that. I got to know the owner. And uh, so I'd been in San Leandro Marina by this um uh, time you know i had the, my boat in there for 20 years and the owner of this boat the sailboat kept saying he was going to sell it he's thinking about selling it and then but he wasn't sure he wanted to keep it and his wife wanted him to sell it but he kept and they'd take it out they'd sail it and, and 
And so I told him, I go, I want to buy it. Will you sell it to me? And he told me, yeah, I'll sell it to you. And then he changed his mind and says, no, I don't want to sell it. And then I'll sell it to you. And then, no, nah, I don't want to sell it. And this went on for like a year. And then he was going to sell it to this guy that he hated. And I found out he's going to sell it to this other guy instead of me. And we got along real good. And I was like, why are you selling it to this other guy? And so finally, um, I, he told me finally, he said, yeah, he'd sell it to me. And, and I, I said, well, can you sell it to me um, next week on a certain day? And he goes, why does it have to be on that day? And I go, well, I go, it's my birthday and it'd be cool to buy the, the boat on my birthday. And then I'll always remember when I bought it. And he goes, he said, no, nah, I don't know if I want to sell it. I was like, great. So this was in August. And then he come back again. I asked him again. He goes, yeah, I'll sell it to you. And I go, will you sell it to me on this day in September? And he goes, why does it have to be on this day in September? And I go, well, it's my mom's birthday. And, I'll, and she died you know, a long time ago. But I told him, I go, it's my mom's birthday and I'll remember the date. And he goes, okay, I'll sell it to you on that day. And he did. He sold it to me on my mom's birthday. So I bought it in 2014 on, uh, on my mom's birthday on uh, September September 17th, 2014 was the day I bought the, this boat I'm on now. So at any rate, that's the story. And so um, if you want to buy a boat, don't buy a wooden boat. I'm telling you, you because like I said, you, uh, you don't have dry rot and you know you don't have dry rot. You might even have a survey that says you don't have dry rot. doesn't mean three months later you, don't have, you have dry rot somewhere because you might. And you have to live with that the entire time and uh and um and then the thing about termites so always get a survey if you're going to buy a boat buy a fiberglass boat i recommend a fiberglass boat with a solid fiberglass hull no core no wooden core no balsa wood core no foam core a lot of boats have foam cores that have foam kind of like this foam here i don't know if you can see it but uh, it's just a uh, closed cell foam that's like waterproof and um uh, the problem with uh, foam or any kind of core, water will penetrate in through the fiberglass um, through osmosis, where it literally makes its way through the fiberglass and into the into the core, and the core can rot. So this boat has solid. It looks like this boat looks like a wooden boat. That's the beautiful thing about it. It looks like a wooden boat, but it's not. It's solid fiberglass. The hull beneath the water line is three inch thick solid fiberglass. This thing is built like a tank, and um, super strong, super seaworthy boat, and. Um, so that's the story. And um, so if you're going to buy a boat, I would suggest fiberglass. I wouldn't buy a steel boat um, because some marinas won't allow a steel boat into the marina because you park a steel boat next to another boat. There's zincs on the prop shaft and rudder post and the prop on boats. You have to have zinc, sacrificial zinc. So the because electrical current will pass through naturally because you're in salt water and it creates two different types of metal in salt water creates a battery. And so current will flow through one metal. And if there are two different types of metals, it's called um, electrolysis. So elect a current will flow from one metal into the other metal. And what happens is it'll take parts of the metal that as it goes out of one metal, it literally takes atoms from that metal, metal atoms from that metal out and puts it into the metal on the other side. So the, what happens is now this metal starts to corrode from that electrolysis. It's called galvanic corrosion. And, it, and so what happens is your prop shaft can get damaged and your prop can get damaged. And you get this galvanic corrosion. It'll, it'll create cracks like in your blades, your prop shaft. And I've literally seen a prop where the blade actually, one of the blades actually just flew off while it was spinning because of the crack from galvanic corrosion. And the problem with that is if you have a, a steel boat parks next to you, uh, then your zincs are going to go on your boat, even though your boat's made out of fiberglass, you're going to deteriorate faster and you're going to have to change your zincs more and they're expensive and you have to either hold the boat out of the water to change them or dive in the water, underwater to change them. And that's what I do on this boat. I have a hookah where I can breathe underwater so I can change my zincs without hauling the boat out. So, um, and then another thing about uh, steel boats is um, they rust and they get galvanic corrosion to the hull. And the guy in Santa Cruz bought this really cool, beautiful sailboat, uh, steel. And again, he didn't have it surveyed. He pulled up the floor, one of the floorboards and he stepped down his foot on the hull, on the steel 
hull and his foot went right through the steel hole and the boat sank, sunk. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, and then aluminum boats are cool. They're real lightweight. And, but the problem with that, if you like drop a dime or a quarter into the bilge and there's salt water down there and you can't get to that dime, it's gonna eat a hole right through the bottom of the boat. So it might take a while, but it, it'll start eating away. And uh, so I, to me, I think fiberglass is the way to go. And um, so at any rate, that's the story. And um, if you found this video helpful or entertaining, please like and subscribe.